getting rid of the police just takes away the most violent tool of white supremacy. But we have to, as abolitionists, as anarchists, we have to recognize that the police aren't the only problem and the state isn't the only problem. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonservium.medium. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 21st episode of the show. As a philosophy and as a practice, anarchism has always had a special interest in the topic of education. Just as we call into question the social role of police or question what it means to be a citizen, so do we criticize the role of a teacher or what it means to be a student. Power dynamics pervade in our society manifesting in overt and subtle ways with varying degrees of obviousness to each individual. Anarchism seeks to make them apparent, to abolish them, and to replace them with infinite freedom. Domination maintains not only through coercion, but also through cultural support of ordinary people for whom hierarchy plagues the very fabric of their psyche. This way of relating to one another is modeled and forced upon a forgotten class of individuals, youth. Through precious formative years that can't be given back, compulsion, punishment, and obedience is worshipped. It's no wonder that so many adults simply cannot imagine a world without such restraints. Luckily, some people are actively fighting against oppression and building alternatives to the toxic status quo. It often seems that being a mover or a shaker naturally stirs controversy. And my guest today is no different. But the truth is, if you're not making someone angry, you're probably not doing it right. Here's my interview with Antonio Bueller. Antonio Bueller is an American educator, anarchist, and activist who co-founded Peaceful Streets Project, an organization dedicated to building and empowering communities to fight police abuse. Antonio is also the founder of Abrome, a learning community which helps young people identify and engage in deep, meaningful, and enduring experiences through self-directed education. Having dedicated a healthy amount of his time and energy to documenting police violence, Antonio is no stranger to the horrors of the police state. Because of his dedication to holding cops accountable, he has also been arrested several times and targeted for state surveillance. He's a passionate and provocative advocate for police abolition and youth liberation. I'm honored to have him on the show today. Antonio, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. How have you been? Long time no talk. Yeah, I've I've been okay. It's a lot going on in the world, for sure. So how have you been holding up in Austin between quarantine and the protests and everything? Yeah, I've been doing okay. I've been so focused on trying to help a brome stick together that I've just really not had much time to do anything. So the quarantine aspect hasn't been as hard for me as I think it might be for a lot of people just because I've just been really engaged and kind of head down. I haven't been participating in the protests and that makes me feel bad but at the same time uh, the only two people I interact with are immunocompromised and I'm just spending so much time with a brome that I'm trying to find other ways to support the protesters but Uh, Like most people, I just feel like it's a very emotional time. There's just so much going on with the insurgency and the pandemic and people uh, worrying about 
being able to stay in their homes and um, the economic turmoil. Uh, it's just, it's been a lot for a lot of people and I, and I definitely feel it, but I feel pretty fortunate that I, I'm not feeling as hard as so many people. Listeners of the show may or may not be aware that uh, both of us sort of started out in the so-called Ron Paul movement. And I'd say we both have come a long way since then. What does your personal journey from there to where you are now look like politically? Yeah, I think that I got to that sort of community because like a lot of people, I was very frustrated with uh, the way politics was playing out. I just felt very disappointed by Republicans and Democrats. And so I found this community that was very energetic and they argued that they had the solutions such as end the Fed, right? And it was really when I got involved in the police issue and dealing with so many victims of the police state and starting to uh, stitch together for myself through the work of others uh, what the problems with the police state were. And I think at the beginning, it was very much a, oh, there's a lot of bad cops out there. We need to do something about it to wait a second. This is actually the institution and the institution exists for a reason. And then recognizing the different ways that uh, the state and social factors, uh, the way that property and money, you know, white supremacy, all those things play into the issues of the police state. That that sort of got me to look beyond sort of just that insular sort of Ron Paul movement. And I was also very disappointed in particular with some of the people in that movement and their views on race in particular. And it really stood out after the Mike Brown killing in St. Louis and Ferguson. And then it's just sort of built from there. And so that was when I started to really question, you know, maybe, maybe we don't have all the answers and maybe it's not this simple in terms of what the solutions are. And that got me to start questioning, um, you know, movements in general, you know, what is the motivation behind movements? What are people looking for? What are they attracted to? Uh, what are they trying to build? And I guess that allowed me to keep moving further left from right libertarian to libertarian in general, left libertarian. And then, you know, starting to appreciate a lot of the anarchist efforts. And it's just been a constant journey of introspection and learning from other people and recognizing where there were issues or concerns that I simply was completely oblivious to or ignorant to. And that allowed me to let go of this notion that I needed to be a part of some sort of political entity. And it freed me up in a lot of ways to be more open to the concerns of people who really don't live my life, who don't look like me, who just have different life experiences and the opportunity to recognize the intersectionality of so many different fights. And so being able to step away from feeling like I was part of a political movement and just being more open to working with people and working against oppression instead of uh, against some sort of political effort really allowed me to sort of move away from that. Uh, speaking of education, you're an outspoken advocate of radically transforming the way we approach education and learning for youth specifically. I have a lot of questions for you, but um, let's start here. What's wrong with public school as we know it? Well, I don't tend to focus on public school. I just like to focus on conventional school because I think that there's very little difference between public schools and private schools in the way that they function. There is a difference in financing and access. But at the end of the day, for me, the problem with schooling is that it takes all the power away from children. It takes power away from communities and it treats children as though they are incompetent, that they can't be trusted and that they have to learn certain behaviors and they have to learn certain content in order to become what they would call productive members of society or good citizens or good workers, etc. And children are people too. And all people deserve basic autonomy. All people deserve the opportunity 
to pursue their interests, to build community with people that they care about, and to be free of just arbitrary dictates or to be free of outsiders telling them what they need to do or what they need to learn. And so I don't think schooling is the root of all problems in our society, but I do believe that schooling really helps condition young people to accept the conditions of society, uh, to accept the hierarchy and the authoritarianism of our society. And it really takes away from young people the notion that they are able to work to improve the human condition. And so I think that you know, the big problem with schooling is just the way that it conditions young people uh, to accept the way things are and to not actively work towards creating better alternatives. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I want to get into the alternative that you've created also uh, very quickly, but I want to ask you a couple other questions. I know that your emphasis isn't solely on public school, but um, you know, with that topic particularly, it seems that most let's say liberal thinkers, would say that the real problem with public school is that there simply are, just aren't enough resources and that if we just pour more resources into public school, that, that'll fix the problem. What's your response to that take? I, I absolutely believe that if society wanted to invest in education, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. The problem is, is that when they want to throw more money at schooling, what they mean is paying teachers more, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but paying teachers more, throwing more money at technology uh, that goes to ed tech companies, uh, paying more money for administrators, uh, getting bigger facilities, swimming pools, football fields, etc. And there's no amount of money that can be poured into conventional schools that will fundamentally change the practices and structures of those schools. At the end of the day, having a rich school that tells children that they need to sit down and shut up and do what they're told has very much a similar effect to a poor school doing the same thing. What we can do with schools is we can simply let go of the coercive nature of schools, the mandated or standardized curriculum of schools, the notion that children don't get to pick and choose how they want to engage with the world. And that actually isn't that expensive. In many ways, it would be much cheaper to have a much higher quality education just by allowing children to opt out of everything that the school does, and thereby the school would be forced to find other ways to support these kids. I don't think that the government or the church or corporations, quite frankly, are really the best vehicles for public education. But if there was a public education sort of vehicle, I think that it would be much better to spend that money on things like public libraries that are fully accessible to all people and allows children to come in and pick and choose what they want to learn. A child who comes through the doors of a library, assuming that they're not being led by a teacher or a parent, um, they have the opportunity to engage in whatever the library has to offer. There's books of every topic that's available. There are computers. There's oftentimes maker spaces. Uh, there are games, right? And so the children get to go into this publicly funded space and they get to engage with it as they see fit. And I think that if, if there must be a public education system, I think that it would be far better if the money was spent on creating resources that kids and community could come together and access as opposed to forcing them to do schooling. And so more money into schooling isn't the solution. Okay. And what are your thoughts on school choice? Well, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of choice, right? The, the problem with school choice is that there's not really much choice. Parents are given the option among a bunch of conventional schoolish sort of settings. And so it's the illusion of choice, really. They don't get to choose to unschool. They don't get to choose to take that money and you know go on road trips to experience the country or experience the world. They don't get to use that money to create gardens in their community, right? Um, so it's usually a choice of the conventional public school, maybe a magnet public school, public charter school, and maybe 
a religious school. And all of those are still schools. And so it's certainly better for a parent to have a couple options that they can lay out for their children than just one option. But the notion of school choice, I, I just don't think is very honest because the choices are so limited. And in order for an organization to receive public money, when it comes to schooling, whoever's receiving that money has to agree to certain terms. And so a brome doesn't receive any money from the state. And there's not really an option two in Texas, but there are options two in states like North Carolina and Florida and California, where you can have homeschool resource centers and other similar alternative schoolish places uh, receive money from the state. But in order to do that, they often are forced to teach certain classes or they're forced to make the kids take tests each year to, to track progress. And so that's money with strings attached that I think is really problematic. So uh, places like a Brome simply aren't going to have access to that money. And most unschoolers will never have access to that money unless they're willing to adopt uh, some sort of stipulations or, or uh, requirements by the state. And, you know, from the perspective of a bureaucrat, that makes sense. You want to have some sort of accountability and you want to be able to measure what that money is going toward. But the problem with that is that interferes with uh, the possibilities for the learner. So in general, I think choice is good. But the way school choice is laid out in this country, uh, I don't actually think that it's helpful. And I do think it's kind of like politics, like this whole push to have vouchers so kids can go to private schools or to put in more public charter schools. It seems like a really good idea. You're giving kids choice and people are pouring their energy into that. But that means that they're not pouring their energy into things that can be really liberatory. And I think the same thing about politics, right? You know, Trump is doing some really horrible things. And, you know, Trump is a disaster in so many ways. And so a bunch of people want to push Biden because if all we have to do is get rid of Trump and then he's in our rearview window. Um, and so people are pouring energy into trying to get Biden elected. And it's just a game that keeps playing out where people pour their energy into marginally less bad efforts, but they put tons of time, energy, and resources into it. And it prevents us from working collectively to create much better alternatives than something that's just simply less bad. You're kind of the definition of a radical then, like someone who goes to the roots of things in order to, to seek solutions to our problems instead of simply proposing reforms. Why is homeschooling not the solution? So I used to be the biggest fan and the biggest proponent of homeschooling because I felt that if you simply get kids out of the system, it would force the system to change. And I, and I think that there is something to be said for just opting out of the system en masse and then forcing the system to respond, hopefully in a way where they adapt what they're doing so that it makes it more attractive for people to stay in as opposed to making homeschooling illegal, which has happened in many, many countries. Um, but my big problem with homeschooling, quite frankly, is that most people are just bringing uh, school into the home, right? And so it's bad when kids are forced to learn stuff that they don't want to learn. I think it's bad when kids are forced to take tests. I think it's bad when kids are forced to uh, behave in a certain way just so that someone can have control of a classroom. And what many parents do is they simply bring those aspects of schooling into the home. They still have curriculum. They still force their kids to uh, go through the curriculum, take tests. They're still forcing their kids to do stuff from hour X to hour Y. And that can be less bad than schooling for a variety of reasons, but it doesn't allow the child to truly figure out who they are and to engage with the world on their terms. I believe unschooling is a much better alternative and unschooling is effectively like homeschooling from a legal perspective where the child doesn't go to a, a school, but instead they are, they're living their life and in the process, that is their curriculum. And so there's no required uh, studying. There's no, you know, unschoolers don't force their kids to read or write or do math, you know, at different times. If the unschooler wants to spend all their time gardening for 
three straight years, then, then that's what they get to do. And I think that that's a much better alternative to just homeschooling, which is often bringing school into the home. Another challenge I see with homeschooling, quite frankly, is that a lot of people homeschool not because they want to liberate their children, but they want to protect their children from outside ideas. Uh, they want to protect their children from um, heathens or Muslims or you know black culture or stuff like that. So it's oftentimes white right-wing conservatives who are choosing to homeschool as a means of protecting their kids from outside ideas. And I think that that is potentially really harmful. And then lastly, many, many homeschoolers, uh, I would say the majority of homeschoolers are pretty active in homeschooling communities. So their kids are still getting an opportunity to interact with and socialize with other people, but they're often insular communities and uh, it's just a lot of work for homeschoolers to make sure that they're allowing their kids, especially younger kids, to really experience the world. And so if they can be a part of a diverse sort of community and be in the community, you know, that would certainly make homeschooling a better alternative than the way that a lot of people are approaching homeschooling. Right. And uh, so you advocate self-directed learning then. How does that look from the parent's perspective? What role do they play in assisting a child in self-directed learning? Yeah, so the thing about self-directed education, so I call it self-directed education, um, and there's other people that call it that as well because self-directed learning is a term that has been used by a lot of schools wherein they suggest like, oh, they're doing self-directed learning. It's like for the next 30 minutes they are to – pace themselves through some sort of software or they're doing self-directed learning. They get to pick amongst five books that they can read. I don't use that term. I focus on self-directed education. And in self-directed education, the parent's role isn't really to be someone who's telling their kids what they need to learn uh, when they need to learn it. They're not picking out curriculum for the kid. They're not telling the kid that they have to join certain clubs or organizations like Boy Scouts or anything. In a self-directed education environment, ideally the adults are learners too. And what they're doing is they're helping to provide a safe, stable environment for that learner to be able to explore their interests and the world uh, without fear of ridicule, judgment, or assessment. They're there to provide support to answer questions when they're asked questions to be in relationship uh, with the kids but at a brome for example the facilitators are never giving formal lessons on anything academic right now if someone asked us to do something like that we would talk about it and see if it was appropriate for what they were looking for but quite frankly no one has ever asked me to teach them how to read or to teach them calculus because that's just not natural but being in the same space with young people for hours on end, days on end, in a non-authoritarian, non-hierarchical way where we value each other as human beings, we call each other by our first names, they're not performing for me. There's no expectations that they do something to make me happy or to get blessed off on uh, by me. What that allows for is it allows for us just to build relationship with each other. And through that, we can have very deep conversations. And because they're not at risk of being judged or assessed or ridiculed, they come to me with things that they're interested in, things that they're insecure about, but they want to figure out whether it's something in their personal life or something that they want to learn about. And that allows us to have really good conversations about what resources are available, what options are available to them. But it, uh, a facilitator relationship in a self-directed education environment is kind of like what you would want ideally in a friendship. When you are hanging out with a friend that you really care about, someone that you really love, and they tell you that they're thinking about maybe becoming a comedian, like quitting their job and going into comedy, right? Uh, what you do as a good friend is you ask questions and you support them, you encourage them, and you may be skeptical, you know, but you're not going to sit there and say, oh, but then you'll be poor for the rest of your life. Oh, you're actually not that funny. You'll never make it. 
what you do as a friend is you say, oh, wow, why is that? Like, why do you want to do that? Have you ever done anything like that? What are your plans going forward? How can I support you? Right. And that's what self-directed education environments are all about. It's just supportive communities that support everyone who wants to develop and grow as an individual. And so it's very unlike teaching or parenting um, in the way that our society looks at it. In fact, when we go to hire people to be facilitators, to bring them on as facilitators, uh, if they've taught before, that's actually a strike against them. Because if they've been a teacher before, um, and it's not always the case, but they're often very focused on getting kids to do things for them. And that's the exact opposite of what we want to do here. Anarchists have a long history of theorizing and actually building alternatives to conventional schooling. And I would say that you're definitely in that tradition. It's one thing to promote an alternative and it's another to build it. And I think you've done exactly that with a brome. Can you explain more about a brome and what it is that you're currently doing with it? What I usually tell people is a brome is a self-directed education community that serves young people and their families by providing them with a psychologically safe space that's anti-oppressive and consensus-based where young people have the autonomy to engage in meaningful learning experiences and come together and play uh, with each other in mixed age settings. It's, it's actually quite simple. There's no sort of magic sauce. There's no special programs that we have that make us some sort of uh, wonderful, perfect sort of education setting. We're just trying to build a community, quite frankly, a supportive community that has shared values where everyone wants to see everyone taken care of. And so our focus is really on culture when we're here. We're not trying to turn kids into Harvard or Stanford admits. We're not trying to turn kids into you know, future lawyers or doctors. We're not even trying to get them to fit into dominant culture, quite frankly. We just want them to be recognized and seen as full human beings and to be able to pursue their interests and be supported in doing so. There are other communities that have popped up that have done something similar. Uh, one thing that we are trying to be very cognizant of with this project is that we don't get sucked into a focus on being successful as a schoolish type place, right? In terms of pushing out certain types of kids, like, you know, say, oh yeah, of, of the 20 kids who graduate here, you know, 10% have gone on to top 10 schools, stuff like that. Or, or, oh yeah, like we have an entrepreneur that just raised $2 million, you know, he's only 18, 18 years old. We don't want to get uh, sucked into that mindset. Uh, we want to stay focused on building a community that is a safe space for all people to engage in. And it's absolutely sort of an experiment that needs to happen in the world many times over um, because young people don't get the opportunity to practice freedom in our society. Uh, they're constantly told what to do and how to do it and there, a bunch of rules are placed around them and limitations are placed around them. And we want them to actually have that opportunity to practice freedom and to have control of their lives. And so there are other communities that are doing something similar, but we try to be, we, we try to ward off the sort of natural desire to try to direct kids and manipulate kids and to try to get them to start moving towards being productive or to uh, engage in activities that society would find uh, valuable, um, at, you know, and just really let them be who they are. That's beautiful, Antonio, and I'm glad that you're doing that. Walk me through what a typical day might look like for a kid involved with a brome. Yeah, that's a question we get a lot, and there's not, there's just not a typical day. Every morning we come together and we have a morning meeting where we share with each other sort of how we're feeling, uh, any updates in our lives that needs community support, and we share intentions for how we want to spend our day uh, we talk about what offerings are available that either other learners might have uh, set up or that facilitators have set up. But oftentimes there's no offerings that are available because no one has set anything up. And then at the end of the day, there's a similar meeting where we recap the day. We talk about how our intentions went. 
and we just check in with each other. And we do have uh, a set the week meeting and a change up meeting, which I can talk about later. Uh, once a week. But other than those meetings, the day is for the children to decide how they want to spend their time. And those meetings are actually quite short. They typically last five to 10 minutes. And so the kids are doing what they want to do. And so some kids just love to play. And so they're running around playing all the time. Some kids want to do work on art projects. Some kids just like, you know, a lot of adolescents, they just want to hang out with each other and talk. Uh, Some kids read, some kids play video games. And some kids do similar things every day and some kids go with the flow and do whatever is exciting on on a given day. Imagine that we were not constrained by a need to make money, right? To have a job, right? If we were free of the requirement to have a job to survive, what would we do with our time? How would we spend our time in a way that we found value in what we were doing? Um, Would we focus on things that would enrich us? Would we focus on things that would improve our relationships? Would we focus on things that would improve our communities? Most people will take very different paths if they have that sort of freedom. And that's the freedom that we want to give to kids or not really give that freedom to kids, just not get in the way of their freedom uh, so that they can pick and choose what works for them. And most kids go through many different interests. And through the years, their interests shift pretty dramatically. And so uh, just allowing them to do what they want to do, you know, that, that's what we do is we get out of their way and we just try to provide a supportive community and we try to be available for them and hold space for them. Uh, because of the pandemic this year, we're actually taking everything outdoors and we're going to be working fully in public spaces or in fields, forests, etc. And so we're not going to be indoors and we're going to be in smaller units. So we're going to have uh, what we call operating cells of four to seven learners with one facilitator at a time, typically. Uh, and that's just to help prevent the spread of, of COVID, both amongst our community and into the broader community. And so Uh, A typical day for us this coming year is we're going to be outdoors a lot. We're going to be doing sort of outdoor activities, hiking, swimming, you know, maybe observing nature, building stuff, you know, trying to improve stuff. Uh, Our one facilitator is going to be doing guerrilla gardening, which is um, planting stuff um, in public spaces. Um, And so the typical day to a lot of people looks like the kids aren't doing anything but playing. And that's kind of true. They are doing a lot of playing, but playing is one of the most powerful ways to learn. And it's one of the most powerful ways to develop from a social emotional perspective, uh, a self-regulation perspective. And it's just a way to enjoy life. You know, we're okay with that. They don't need to be miserable (laughs) to be to be doing something meaningful with their day. Some kids seem to thrive in structure. How do we cultivate that while avoiding authoritarianism? Yeah. You know, some kids seek out structure and that's okay. We live in a society where kids often need structure or people need structure because they've never had the opportunity really since they were like three. (laughs) They've never had the opportunity to be in charge of structuring their own time. And so without external structure, uh, it can become really overwhelming to people because they don't know how to perform. They don't know how to get things done outside of people giving them tasks, outside of external standards and benchmarks. And so I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we were schooled and it's hard for many of us who were schooled to be without formal structure. And so therefore we assume that kids need that structure when really it's a conditioned response within us to seek out that structure. There are also kids who because of the environments that they've been in, they seek out validation from adults. And so they seek out opportunities for validation and that often comes with structure, right? There are kids out there, lots of adults, as you know as well, who just want to be successful and perform and get lots of accolades for being the very best that they can be. Um, and you know, if you're truly free and you're not competing with other people, it's hard to get that constant validation of, oh, you're really great because you're better than everyone else. 
but there's there are situations in which structure helps and if people want that structure in a self-directed education environment they can ask for that structure they can say you know what i really want to learn something and i think it would be far easier to learn it if i enrolled in some sort of online course or um, I really want to get a project done, but I can't seem to get anywhere on it. Like, how do I actually move forward? And then we can talk about maybe some sort of project management tools that, that can be helpful uh, because structure can certainly help. But the difference is, is that in a self-directed education environment, the structure is something that we might introduce as a, hey, you seem to be asking for help. Uh, you seem to be drowning in whatever it is that you're working on or what you're trying to accomplish and therefore here are some tools that might be helpful to you take them or leave them they're just tools if they don't work for you don't use them but if they work for you then then go for it and so they can be introduced to structure in a way that's voluntary in a way that they see it as something that's helpful to them to do something that they care about as opposed to creating structure around the kids simply because we think that the kid needs structure. And I think that uh, in the great majority of circumstances, that's just simply not the case. The kids just, you know, we're, we're placing on the children some of our own limitations within our mind. So it seems like a lot of your critiques of schooling would also obviously apply to higher education. What's wrong with higher education, in your opinion, and how do we fix it? Yeah, there's so much wrong with higher education. I think that the notion with fixing things is, is difficult, right? Because some things don't need to be fixed, right? Just like policing doesn't need to be fixed. Policing just needs to disappear. You know, higher education, it's kind of a unique thing because higher education has so many different roles. And uh, one of the roles is job training. Uh, and, and it's terrible at job training, but private corporations have basically been able to not invest in training their people um, because they keep unloading more and more onto schools. You know, it's basically job training. And I'm thinking particularly of, of fields like engineering and computer science, et cetera, right? Where, you know, the schools are expected to train people to be good workers, it's a certification sort of industry wherein uh, the goal is to, uh, you know, there's different interests uh, want to limit the supply of, say, doctors, right, or engineers. And so they use schooling as a way to limit the number of people that can go into that field. And so they use certification and the college degree is very often the lowest level certification for many different fields. Higher education is also a place for research, right? It has nothing to do with students. It has a lot to do with uh, professors doing research and getting published. It's also uh, entertainment uh, through sports. And in some places, education is actually valued, oftentimes small liberal arts schools, where the purpose is actually just to play with ideas and to challenge yourself with those various ideas. Another one is just to be a hedge fund, right? To build a big endowment and to manage that money to keep growing the endowment, right? So um, there's a lot of different sort of charges that universities have. And I would say that most of them don't actually serve the students who are going through the universities. Uh, the universities have institutional objectives that have nothing to do with learning for the people, right? It has nothing to do with making society a better place. And so to some degree, I think that disentangling some of that would be helpful. And I think that if society could get away from credentialism and um, a focus on certain brands, which tend to help people with the most power and money, it just allows them to confirm for themselves in their minds that they're the best. You know, I think that that would be helpful in uh, undoing a lot of the unfortunate things that happen through higher education. It's a complicated, uh, complicated issue, and I don't think that there's really an easy fix for it. Other than providing alternatives to schools, 
How can we help assist in youth liberation more broadly? You know, children are an oppressed class, and I'm not saying they're more oppressed or less oppressed than other groups, you know, because sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But in our society, if young people are out and about, oftentimes they get the cops called on them because they're not supposed to be out, right? Especially if they're adolescents. Well, if they're young, they get the cops are called because parents aren't watching them. And if they're adolescents, they get called, uh, the cops get called because they're they might be up to no good type stuff. And so I, a big part of it is just changing the way that we view children in the world. And that's one thing that we try to do through a brome. And we ha- we're affiliated with uh, the Flying Squads, which is a group of self-directed education type folks, you know, who are trying to retake public spaces for young people, like having kids out in the world and flexing their ability to be in the world so that people stop thinking that from nine to five on Mondays through Fridays, you know, we shouldn't be seeing kids in the world. I think that uh, opening up public spaces to young people and challenging businesses that prevent young people from being there um, is really great. Um, unfortunately, there's just a lot of laws and restrictions on kids that, you know, things that young people can't do, such as work. And people could get involved in some of the legislative efforts to try to undo some of that. But uh, the one thing that we can all do is just change the way that we interact with children, right? Not expecting them to behave or perform for us, changing the way that we talk to them instead of asking them what they want to be when they grow up. (laughs) Ask them, you know, what are they interested in? What are they doing today? Um, never asking what grade they're in because that's just a way of sort of bucketing them. Yeah, so it's just basically treating children like you would treat a friend again, right? Like you would never ask your friend what they're going to be when they grow up. Like, oh, well, you know, you're all you're doing is waiting tables. What do you want to be when you grow up, right? Like that's not helpful. People can always create spaces that accept children and allow children to be free. I think that that is one super powerful thing. And people can, you know, flex those efforts in public spaces. Uh, I, I don't have a, a very good answer as like to what people who aren't working with kids regularly can do uh, to support youth liberation. No, Antonio, I thought that was. I think that's great. Um, so I want to transition into uh, a different topic that you're passionate about and interested in. You mentioned it earlier that obviously privatizing a bad thing doesn't automatically turn it into a good thing. Right. An analogy might be drawn about the police. That's another major aspect of your work. And after the murder of George Floyd and the protests that followed, people are now starting to seriously consider defunding or abolishing police departments. What does a healthy transition away from policing as we know it look like? I don't have the answers to that. And I think it's really challenging because the police have been used to control the population and to act on behalf of the state in a variety of different ways. And so what does it mean to defund the police? Uh, And some people want to defund the police by just taking away some of their money and making them let go of some of their responsibilities. Whereas I'm of the idea that you defund the police until they're gone. Right. But I don't know what a healthy transition away from policing looks like. I do know that that the police are a really harmful entity that cause much more harm than good to people and communities. And that there's virtually nothing that the police do that couldn't be done better by someone else. And so uh, when I think of what a healthy transition away from policing might look like, Uh, One is just reducing the number of police, right? Because what we know is that the percentage of time that police are actively dealing with incidents of harm, like violence, is extremely small. In most cities, it's in the very low single digits of percentage of time that police officers spend on the job where they're actually dealing with issues of assault, rape, murder, you know, actual crimes, So just by decreasing the number of police radically, drastically, um, I think that that would help immensely because to the extent that people think we need police for those violent activities, you know, then it allows them to increase 
the percentage of time that they spend on those, like on trying to solve murders. The police are expected to do a lot of civil enforcement, getting involved in things like theft and whatnot. You know, it's a civil matter. I don't think that we need to have people with guns who have, you know, a, a racist institution, um, one that shoots first and asks questions later. They don't need to be involved in civil affairs, right? Actual investigations, like why do you need cops who are going to shoot people to do investigations of crime? I don't think that that needs to be done. Uh, mental health calls when someone is having a mental health crisis. You don't need to send someone with a gun who's going to shoot the person, right? Uh, up to 50% of the people killed by police, if some people say, are dealing with a mental health crisis, right? And so you certainly don't need police to be dealing with those uh, situations. But the thing I really appreciate about the abolitionists who've been doing this work for so long is they've never argued that getting rid of the police and simply um, turning the different jobs of the police over to other entities, less violent entities, has been the solution. Abolitionists have long argued that the solution is dealing with the conditions that cause crime, you know, such as a lack of community, uh, such as this focus on punishing people instead of helping people, you know, economic justice, you know, just getting people so that they, they have some security in their life. You know, those things would do a lot more. Conflict resolution would do a lot more to deal with crime than um, having a certain number of police on the street. And so the abolitionists don't just want to get rid of the police and replace them with something else. Now, abolitionists, uh, like many radicals, want to fundamentally change the way that social relations are um, within our society so that we are more supportive of one another so that we're not so quick to bring violence into a situation because there's a homeless person in our neighborhood or because there's you know some strange people of color that I haven't seen before hanging out, right? Um, you know, instead of calling in uh, potential violence through the police because people feel uncomfortable is sort of like getting to know your neighbors, uh, building communities that are safe, building communities that support each other you know, dealing with the issues of people without, um, all of those things, I think are much better ways to, to work on creating a healthy society than, than continuing to support this institution of policing. And with any transition, of course, there's going to be instances where harm is done. Like there's lots of harm that's done right now that doesn't come from the state. It's just we are an imperfect uh, species and there are asymmetries that often lead to harm. And as we move away from policing, uh, what people are going to do is every single time there's a murder, they're going to say, this is why we need police. Or every single time there's a rape, this is why we need police. This is why we need jails. And I think the critical thing is, is that people don't focus on uh, the imperfections of us trying to move towards a better society, but to keep our focus on why is it that we're moving. You know, the institution of policing has done so much harm and it's been used as a tool to perpetuate some of the worst injustices in our society. And there's really nothing that the police do that can justify that harm. And so even if we replace the police with nothing and there was a vacuum and in that vacuum, certain people would take advantage of that temporary space that didn't have anything in it. I, I, I would still think it would be a good move for society to venture down that path instead of just having the security of, of having the police, which disproportionately harms people, you know, that are the most marginalized and oppressed in society already. So, you know, again, I don't have the answer because I don't think there is an answer, but I do think that creating alternatives aggressively advocating to abolish the police or engaging in direct action in such a way that it kind of makes it necessary for the state to start to acquiesce, I think is just generally a good thing. Right. So we know that policing disproportionately affects black people and people of color. Um, what role would police abolition have in ending institutional racism? Yeah, the thing that I love about abolitionists 
is that, in general, is that they don't think policing is the problem, right? They think that policing is very harmful, right? The problem is, is that we have an unhealthy society and white supremacy is a function of our society. And the police are used as a violent tool to support white supremacy. And so that has disproportionate impacts on people of color, particularly black and indigenous people. And so abolitionists, they don't think that getting rid of the police is the solution to racial injustice. And they see the necessity of dealing with uh, white supremacy from a societal perspective in the many different ways that it sort of manifests itself to include in our personal lives. And so getting rid of the police just takes away the most violent tool of white supremacy. But we have to, as abolitionists, as anarchists, we have to recognize that the police aren't the only problem and the state isn't the only problem. You know, the state through jails and prisons, but also through many of their social services, you know, financial institutions, uh, the way that they do loans, um, the way that uh, they district businesses into certain communities, um, the way that they deal with pollution, uh, you know, what, what type of industries can pollute in certain communities. You know, all of those things are things that the state do that are beyond the scope of policing. And then just the acceptance of white supremacy within our society, you know, not just the overt racism, but, you know, some of the subdued racism that plays out in everyday interactions All of that needs to be addressed and taken on because getting rid of the police will absolutely have a huge benefit to society. You're taking away this very harmful mechanism that disproportionately harms people of color, but it's it's simply not sufficient. And so we have to address it in all of our organizations, businesses, community groups, nonprofits, book groups, like, you know, everything, you know, our friend groups needs to be addressed everywhere. What's the most common criticism you hear about police abolition and how do you respond to it? I, I think the most common criticism is just what do you do with murderers and rapists? Like how, what are you going, what are you going to do about those people? Who's going to catch the murderers? You know, how do you get the rapists off of the street? And that's a, di- that's a difficult one because people have this conception that the only way you deal with that is through policing and incarceration. But the challenge with that is that people who hurt other people most often have been victims before, right? Like they, they've suffered trauma in their own lives. And this focus on catching them and punishing them, that doesn't actually do anything for the person who's been harmed, except for maybe the peace of mind that they're off the street, right? But we don't invest anything pretty much in our society into supporting victims, helping them through therapy and support, restitution, none of that. We don't focus on that. What we focus on is punishing people who get caught. And the overwhelming majority of rapes, you know, the the person doesn't get caught or doesn't get convicted. The the closure rate for uh, murders solved is, I believe, at the lowest it's been since the 70s, right? So it's not like we're doing a bang-up job of of even identifying and convicting murderers. And oftentimes the murderers that are, con- the people who are convicted didn't even commit the crime. And some people might say it's less than 1%, but that's a huge number, right? <laughs> you know, if, if you're an innocent person. But yeah, so, so we take these people who are harmed and then we punish them. And we punish them in pretty cruel ways. We take them away from society. We put, you know, prisons are just horrible, horrible places where trauma gets amplified many times over. And so then they come out and they are often in a worse place than when they went in, you know, which potentially is more harmful to society. The person that we neglected to take care of the victim, they're dealing with trauma. And now that trauma might be externalized onto other people. And so we have this situation where police and prisons aren't actually helping us with violent crime. It's actually increasing the problem. Because it's not taking care of the victims and it's making the perpetrators oftentimes even worse. Then we're destroying their families because we're taking people out of their lives. We're destroying them economically. Even if they get out of prison, oftentimes they can't get jobs. And so now you compound the adversity with poverty or economic distress. You know, that's super problematic. And then the police 
are some of the biggest purveyors of violence in our society. Like, I believe it's one out of every three people who are killed by a random person are killed by a police officer. So most, most murders are between people who know each other, like family members, for example. And it's unfortunate, of course, right? But that's something that we as a society can improve on if we improved on the way that we dealt with conflict and if we supported each other better. But the random murders are, are definitely something that we should always be concerned about. And one out of every three murders is done by a police officer. So you can't tell me that that isn't a bad thing, right? And so I just don't see how policing is beneficial when it comes to murders. With rapes, police, uh, I believe, rape more people than any other profession. They also murder more people than any other profession. Uh, 40% of uh, spouses of law enforcement or maybe it's family members of law enforcement or victims of domestic violence, right? And so this institution of policing is extremely violent. And so if we're concerned about violence, you know, policing and prisons aren't helping with that. Uh, if you're concerned about rape, prisons become rape centers, right? Like rape is rampant within prisons and prison staff doesn't mind it. You know, they, they see it as part of their ability to control um, inmates. And so people fear having a world without police and prisons because they just think that um, without police and prisons, there's not going to be any accountability and there's not going to be any punishment for people who do harm. Um, but the challenge is, is that these systems create more harm and they do much, much greater harm than having, you know, some people get away with murder or some people get away with rape, right? And if we got rid of these systems, which we think hold people accountable, but they don't, they just punish people. What we could do is we could actually implement accountability systems into the way that we interact with, e with each other. So imagine that if someone were to rape someone, instead of calling the police on them and having them arrested and thrown in jail and then convicted and then thrown in prison, which happens in a small minority of rapes, right? Imagine if we had some sort of agreements within our society where uh, that person had to do something to rehabilitate the situation by getting help for themselves and by working to try to make the person that they hurt better off you know, whether it's supporting their therapy, whether it's financially, et cetera. Like that, a system like that would be far better than um, just relying on police and prisons to deal with the situation. If someone were to murder someone, instead of just, you know, locking them up and throwing away the key, like what if that person, you know, was expected to help the family move on, get the support that they need, uh, financial, you know, and therapy. I think that those would be far better ways of working together as a society. And uh, police and prisons just don't help, but people are wedded to what they know. Like they, you know, it's always been there. It hasn't been, but they think it has. It's always been there. And with, and so therefore that is what we need to do to move forward. And it's just not the case. Same thing with schools, right? You know, schools are a relatively recent phenomena, just like police are, but people can't imagine a world without either. Right. I think people's imaginations are starting to expand recently, especially after George, George Floyd. I think people are actually starting to consider the fact that all cops might, in fact, be bastards. <laughs> and um, what's your response to, like, scab centrists or liberals who say, you know, it's just a few bad apples. It's not really, it's not really all cops. You know, it, it depends on my relationship with the person and how close I was to them. But sure, it's not all cops, right? Like everyone's an individual and you never know if there's that one person who joined the force because they really wanted to support their community or they wanted to change the organization from within. Sure, whatever, you can have that. I'll, I'll let you have that, right? The problem is, is it's the institution, right? The institution has objectives that are harmful to society. Uh, the institution uses violence to carry out those objectives. Uh, the institution is inherently racist and classist. It's xenophobic. It is ableist, right? You know, there's just the system causes so much harm. And even if you put in um, angels into the police department, they would still do harm because they would see that as their job. 
even the best police officers are doing harm. So sure, if you don't want to say all cops are bastards, fine, right? But they're all doing harm. Even in the best of circumstances, they're doing harm. And maybe we don't need to have a personal judgment on that police officer to recognize that. I, I just, it really frustrates me when people say, but not all cops are bad. It's like, does it matter? Doesn't matter if not all cops are bad if policing does so much harm. Maybe the problem is policing. But I had an experience where me and another cop watcher got ticketed. Uh, we went into a park at night because we had like five police officers surrounding this one black guy in, in Givens Park in East Austin. And we went in to film it just to make sure that the police didn't do anything inappropriate, didn't abuse the person. And it was dark out. And so if we weren't close, we wouldn't be able to see what was happening, right? We wouldn't be able to bear witness. Uh, we wouldn't be able to show solidarity with the person. We wouldn't be able to change the behavior of the police officers. They threatened us with arrest and fine. They ultimately fined us. They didn't arrest us, which was, you know, a change in tactics by the police. Um, but we went and fought against that ticket. And so I was there to testify on behalf of the air cop watcher. And as a witness, I couldn't be in the courtroom. Um, and so therefore, neither could the police that were testifying. The police have their own little room where they can sit. But this police officer decided to sit in the hallway uh, with me at a different bench. And he just turned to me, obviously, to have a conversation. He turned to me and said, hey, Antonio, you don't know me, but I know who you are. And I'm just wondering, do you think that all cops are bad? And I was just like, listen, I, like, I don't think that's a fair question. I think that all cops do bad things. And he was like, absolutely not. Like, I joined it for the right reasons. I don't do bad things. I do everything above board, this and that. And we got into a long conversation about, you know, racism, you know, how the police are used against certain people and not against other people, how laws are made and how laws are enforced. And this guy insisted that he's not racist. He's never met any racists in the police force. He was a young police officer. And he wanted me to know that he was one of the good ones. He joined the profession so he could help people. And my parting words to him were, I hear you, but if you stay in this profession, you're going to hurt people. And if you stay in this profession, you're going to lose your soul. And that was the last thing I said to him. And it was a, it was a very pleasant conversation. We weren't mean to each other. We weren't barking at each other. I didn't call him a bastard or an asshole. And we went our separate ways. He didn't show up to testify the next morning which was a big problem because he testified for the prosecution that night and he was supposed to come back and get crossed by the defense the next morning. In the American legal system, you're supposed to have the opportunity to cross every single uh, person who has testified. Um, so he didn't show up. Prosecutors are making excuses, saying there was a, a family matter that came up. Uh, they almost uh, declared a mistrial, but the defense attorney agreed to go forward with it if they could enter evidence without the state objecting to it, I believe. So the defense, I think, just wanted to be able to introduce the video, <laughs> which showed what the cops did, and they were going to object to that. And they, they said, instead of a mistrial, because you don't, you don't get across this police officer, you know, how about we just don't object to you laying this video in? This is a very long story, but long story short, uh, the fellow cop watcher was found not guilty but we never knew why the cop didn't show up. This cop just wanted to do good. Later that weekend, we finally found out the reason. He was one of the cops who shot and killed a man downtown. And it was wow. a situation. Yeah. And, it, and, and I told this guy, you're going to lose, you're going to lose a part of your soul if you stay in this job. And he just wanted to help the community. And he shot someone who did not need to be shot. He killed someone oh my God. who did not need to be killed. And so, sure. If you don't want to believe that all cops are bastards, whatever, you can have that one. I'll even give that one to you. But they're all doing harm. You know, in my eyes, they're a bastard, right? But they might think that they're doing the right thing. But the institution is the problem. And you can't find enough angels to fix that institution. They, they simply don't exist. That was pretty incredible. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, so if we're looking at it pessimistically, if we can't get outright abolition, what is the most immediately necessary reform that needs to happen to the police? I think that the number one thing we can do is just drastically reduce the number of police officers. Uh, but that's a virtual impossibility uh, politically. I've long said the best thing that you can do 
with the police that are on the force is take away all their weapons, take away all their toys. Don't dress them up so that they look like they're in the military. Dress them up in in straight white outfits with blue bow ties. Uh, tell them that their job is to be community service. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. I think that that would go a long way to changing the culture of policing. To some extent, some people have argued that police should be like firefighters. They should be sitting around in an office all day, only called out to deal with like an active shooter situation. I think that that would be helpful. But ultimately, it again, it's the institution, right? And the way that the institution uh, meshes with other institutions in our society. And all of that has to be addressed uh, simultaneously. But uh, yeah, I think if you took away their weapons, that would, be a, that would be a huge, huge step forward. I would say stuff like actually prosecute cops for the crimes that they commit, but I just think that that's a bridge too far. No one's going to do that. Um, that's not, I think it would be easier to disarm the police than it would be to actually start prosecuting the police. <laughs> wow, yeah, you're probably right on that. Um, do you think body cams and dash cams were a good reform? Dash cams were already out by the time I got involved, but body cams were something that came on the scene as I was getting involved. And I thought that they would be a good thing in general because at least it would prevent cops from outright lying about what happened. What it actually was able to do uh, was support cops in outright lying. Uh, They got to control the video. They got to use the video in a manner that allowed them to craft their prosecution. You know, they conveniently ignored when police committed crimes or lied in video, and they focused on the way that that video could be used to prosecute people. The interesting thing about body cams I didn't know is there's a psychological perspective where you're seeing it from the police officer's perspective. And so all you're seeing is like the uh, facial expressions of victim or perpetrator, whatever you call them. You're seeing what that person's doing. You're seeing that person not immediately obeying a certain order. You know, you you might see that person pull away. Um, What you don't see is the police officer balling up his fist, you know, you know, giving like a, you know, mean stare at someone, you know, cocking their head a certain way, leaning forward. So, so the body cams have actually done, I think, a great disservice in general. Occasionally, it's used against a police officer. So there's been a lot of police officers, you know, more than most people would suspect uh, police officers accidentally filming themselves planting drugs, for example. Well, in those instances, it's been helpful, sure, when the defense could actually get that video. Um, But I think that that they've done more harm than good. Just I, I actually think most reforms do more harm than good because most reforms give people the illusion that the institution is interested in policing itself or getting better. And what it, what it really does is it allows people to, to avert their gaze. All right, we, we had a win. You know, now, now they have body cams. Now I can go back to my life. And they, they don't fight for uh, the abolition of a really oppressive and harmful and violent institution. I see the same thing happening right now. They're willing to take down a Columbus statue. Okay, now are you all willing to go home? They're willing to paint Black Lives Matter on a street. Are you willing to go home now? We're going to take away $11 million from the police. Can you go home now? And that's been a tool that's been very effective in the past, particularly because there's so many nonprofits that just want to show that they've had wins. They're not actually looking for liberation. They're looking to be able to show their donors that they've been effective. And so I think reforms are a great way to strengthen the uh, sort of credibility of oppressive institutions in our society. And what it does is it allows people to, you know, sort of accept small wins, which aren't really wins, and think that they're getting progress. What role has cop watching played in police accountability? It's a great question. I ask myself that all the time. I am very disillusioned by the many, many hours and the multiple arrests that I've had. I think six arrests now, cop watching, because I thought that it would have more of an impact. And the reality is, is that showing the world what police do 
doesn't really cause change. Um, there's not a single politician who's ever seen a cop watch video and said, oh my God, like we need to change things, right? I've never seen a police officer observe another police officer from a cop watch video doing something corrupt and say, oh my God, I have to campaign against corruption in the police department. Uh, so there's a lot of frustration that I have that cop watching hasn't had much of a role in police accountability. I mean, there is no police accountability. Police aren't held accountable. So it's not like cop watching has brought about some sort of accountability movement within law enforcement. Now, what cop watching has done and that I find value in is it's given people the ability to engage in direct action to push back against the police state. And with the exception of like an uprising, which is happening right now, there's usually very little that people can do in terms of direct action to, to actually go out and push back against the police, right? And cop watching allows people that, that vehicle. It allows people to build solidarity within their community against the institution of policing. It allows people to build relationships with each other that might be leveraged into other types of organizing that can be abolitionists in nature. It's sort of doing the, doing the work early on to build those bonds and connections and to build that understanding of, of what the conditions are so that in moments of like this uprising, there's already those connections, there's already those discussions of what policing is so you don't get sucked into the reformist politics, um, but you're able to go hard at pushing for everything that's possible. And you're planting seeds in people's minds. So we haven't been able to change politicians. We haven't been able to change police. We haven't been able to change prosecutors. But to some extent, you know, seeing people out there cop watching, seeing us stand up against the police and get arrested, that might have helped people who otherwise might not have jumped into the fray during this uprising uh, get involved. I don't know the answer to that. And there's no way for me to measure that. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that the cop watching has been a waste of time. I actually think it's been very, very valuable, but it certainly hasn't had an impact on the institutions. Like they've changed their policy. They, they've changed their practices a little. They don't still arrest us anymore, which is a plus. But policing hasn't improved because of cop watching. Prosecutors don't go after corrupt cops because of cop watching. Politicians aren't trying to defund the police because of cop watching. I think that the benefit of cop watching has been in helping people uh, recognize that they can have a hand in shaping the direction of society and moving towards abolition or at least defunding the police in a way that where they may have just felt helpless before. Look, um, I, I agree with your take there, but you know George Floyd's death was filmed and that inspired a lot of people to get out on the streets you know so i think that w the work that you've done has contributed towards a culture that empowers people to do that even if they're not a part of a formal organization such as peaceful streets project george floyd's death is on camera because someone was brave enough to hit record on their phone and now people are on the streets because of it and now people are seriously talking about radical reforms Right. Even even though we want abolition, they're seriously defunding the police is on the table. So I just want to say, Antonio, I, I appreciate the work that you've done uh, in that and contributing towards that culture. And um, even though it, you know, it, I'm sure it's tiring. Um, I just want to I just want to say from an outsider's pr perspective that I think that what you've done ha has been helpful. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> that means a lot. For sure. So towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of ideas or people and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Sure. Alex Jones. A, a joker, uh, an, an enabler of fascist ideology, takes people who, who want to be contrarian and takes them down absurd conspiracy uh, rabbit holes. I think that he does more to support the efforts of the CIA than any <laughs> any member of the CIA because he he gets people to focus on the most absurd stupidity and it allows everyone to just blow off anyone who ever has any critiques of what the government might actually be doing. 
just completely problematic. Red guards. Um, same. It's completely problematic. <laughs> uh, uh, just so so many people in this world just want to find a cult to be a part of that has all the answers and that allows them to feel like they're fighting the revolution. And I just, it is a cult. They're toxic and they do great harm. And, and I'm glad that leftists have recognized the harm that they do and that they, that they don't play with them anymore. Uh, red cops are still bastards. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah. Um, Garrett Foster. I, a, a hero. I think that he put his life on the line as all protesters are doing. Um, they may not realize it, but they're putting their lives at risk. Uh, he was consistent. He had been out there for, I believe, 50 straight days. He believed Black Lives Matter. He believed that policing was um, an institution that was inherently harmful. I, I didn't know him personally, but I think that pe- I think he's a hero, and I think it's a I think it's disgusting how people are trying to slander him in death, considering the fact that he was a victim of a murder. All right, so I want to move on to some listener questions, and then we can um, go to the actual end of our conversation. The first listener question is, how was it for you emotionally being labeled a domestic extremist and also knowing that you were a targeted victim of of state surveillance? I mean, being labeled a domestic extremist was just something that I found funny at the time because we found out in retrospect, we found out much later because of a public information request uh, that that showed us that. So I didn't realize it at the time. And so by, and by the time I found out, I figured, yeah, I figured that they probably labeled me that. Um, but when I found out that the state was like really tracking everything that I did, like that definitely sucked. <laughs> it, you know, it, it made me feel like everything that I had to do was perfect because they would exploit any opportunity to take me down. Um, I, I had police like sitting outside my house. I had cops like tracking my social media, uh, trying to figure out who all my contacts were, um, doing like background checks into who my contacts were. You know, that was that was all frustrating. Part of it is that I recognize my extreme privilege and that this has happened to you know countless other people, and I at least had some great attorneys who were helping me with it, and I had a community of people who were supporting me. Um, I know that they've done much worse to so many other people. So it sucked emotionally. I think that I dealt with it much better than many other people uh, had uh, who had known about it um, just because I had a big support network. So I was very lucky in that regard. What was it like organizing an event with a co-founder of the Black Panther Party, Bobby Seale? Yeah, I don't even know because I was so busy with the event and I didn't get to enjoy that. Um, I, I got to have dinner with Bobby the night before the event, which was like my only opportunity to really sit. And then I had lunch with him afterward with a big group of people. And so it was nice talking to him and hearing his perspectives and his story. But I was so busy running the event, trying to make sure that everything was running smoothly that I didn't get to really enjoy the experience, which I think was was unfortunate for me. All right, two more listener questions. Is it possible to responsibly critique or propose reforms to our actually existing monopoly educational system without a broader sociological or economic analysis? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I think the answer is, yeah, of course we can propose reforms. I think that without that broader analysis, those reforms are always going to be uh, very narrow and they're going to miss uh, the bigger questions of what's the problem with schooling. You know, what harm does schooling do to people and to society, right? And so when you don't take in those broader perspectives and factors, I think it's just too easy to focus on changing the curriculum, giving, you know, more freedom here or more freedom there, you know, giving teachers more autonomy, this and that, like those things are all fine and dandy. But when you take a step back and look at the institution of schooling and recognize that it's meant to preserve the status quo, to preserve 
uh, hierarchies within society to convince people that they need to conform to society instead of changing society. Only by stepping back and looking at those other factors can you actually see that. And so uh, there's a lot of people in the business of school reform that simply don't get it. And they just want to make schools run better. They want to make schools a little less harmful. I'm a huge advocate of getting cops out of schools. That's great. But most teachers, I, I saw a survey somewhere recently where teachers want cops in school, <laughs> in poor schools, right? And the reason is because they, they want protection from the students, right? And it's just sort of like, let's dig into that a little bit, right? Wow, the same way a boss might fear a worker. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And um, the last listener question, uh, one of our most popular listener questions is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? I don't think there is a utopia. And it's something that took me a long time to get to because I always thought that my ideas were the answer or the uh, sort of ideology that I accepted was the answer. And I just think that humans are an interesting species and you know we're very creative and we're very social and we screw things up a lot um, but I think that ultimately if there is a utopia that utopia would involve a lot of really difficult conversations and difficult projects that fail and a lot of hard lessons learned and just constant continual community building and so how would you get cappuccino I don't know I'm sure there'd be a lot of different ways that people would try to provide a cappuccino. But I just, I don't think utopia exists and I've let go of that notion. I just think that we can always shoot for better. We can always shoot for better ways to relate with each other. Where can folks go to follow you and your work? I spend most of my time with Abrome, A-B-R-O-M-E. That's the education community, self-directed education community. And they can go to abrome.com and they can find us on social media. Um, and yeah, if they could support me by telling people about what we're doing, uh, that would be great. With Peaceful Streets Project, we've really taken a big step back during this uprising and the pandemic, quite frankly, but especially during the uprising because we just feel like it's not our moment. It's not a time for people to be focused on cop watching. I think that there's a lot of really great autonomous collections of people who are engaging in really radical direct action against the police and i think that needs to be the focus and so uh we've kind of gone out of our way not to make anything about the peaceful streets project during this moment in time um but we do have a we do have a social media presence uh it's nothing that i think is really impactful in this moment i think a far more impactful way for people to support the work that we do with policing is quite frankly to go out to protest or cop watch themselves um, and challenge everyone that they meet on this notion of uh, whether or not we need policing and what a world uh, without policing can look like. What organization should folks support or become involved with right now? Uh, Not nonprofits. So I think that people should find Um, People who are on the ground just autonomously organizing and pushing back against the police. I think that there's a lot of people out there who are risking their lives, they're risking their health, they're risking their freedom. So supporting those people is critical. Providing them with supplies, providing them with medical support uh, when they get injured, providing them with legal support when they get arrested. Um, I think that that is probably the best use of people's money if they're in, if they're really interested in supporting organizations. I'm really disappointed with all of the sort of community and nonprofits that were established that were supposed to be fighting against this and their lack of uh, willingness to jump in and really support the people who are on the front lines, the people who are putting their lives at risk. And so Um, I think that the people on the ground are the ones that deserve the support more than anything else. All right, Antonio. Well, do you have any final thoughts, any last words, or is there anything that I forgot to ask you that we'd like to, you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? No, it was a pleasure chatting with you. 
It was a pleasure chatting with you too, Antonio. And um, next time I'm uh, back in Austin, uh, assuming that this uh, coronavirus thing goes away, I'd like to buy you beer. All right, I'll see you in 2023. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn, man. Hopefully sooner than that, but yeah. ooh, we'll see. Thanks again for coming on. I uh, can't thank you enough for joining me, and um, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. All right, Antonio. Bye. All right, bye. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my conversation with Antonio Bueller. If you liked this episode, you can find more interviews like this one at youtube.com slash nonserviumedia. Be sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you'd like to support Nonservium Media, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviumedia. Shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us keep this project going. And if you can't help financially, be sure to like and share this episode. Thank you all so much for your support, and thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.